You're listening to the Prevailing Word podcast channel and also on our Prevailing Word live YouTube channel. I'm Pastor Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening. Let's get right into the message. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Go over into uh, the first first, uh, Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 3, as I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in faith. Uh, Now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith, from which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless, the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the ungod- for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God who was committed to my trust. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible to God, who alone is wise, be glory and honor, forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy. According to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, 
whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. When you have individuals that desire to be teachers of the law and then turn around to blaspheme, anyone with any kind of sense would back away from these individuals. But sadly, some do not get it. In fact, they continue with them and simply say it like this. Oh, it's no big deal. When it is a big deal, we have no business following after people that blaspheme, curse the name of our God, and teach strange doctrine. And as a result of their acts, people have suffered shipwreck. Now, if you know anything about shipwrecks, if you've been by the sea, you would see that a, a shipwreck is what is termed the wreck of a ship. Over time, because of the elements, various chemical elements, including rust and oxygen, it gets to the, uh, the ship, and over time, uh, it breaks apart. But it would not have broken apart, perhaps, if it didn't run aground. Uh, what we mean by running aground is when the bottom of the ship hits the bottom of the, of the ocean. Um, going back in my operation specialist days as a chart petty officer and navigation supervisor, uh, we would mark on our charts exactly where certain hazards to navigation would be, part of which would be shipwrecks. We would get uh, a periodic memorandum called a notice to mariners. And on each page is a chart number. On that specific page with the chart number would be the location of the wreck. So if you happen to be sailing in a particular area, you would be drawn to the attention of the location of where that wreck is, the latitude and longitude on the, on the chart in which you are navigating out at sea as you're going either towards land or out of land. Now it's very rare that there would be a floating object out at sea, but there was one instance when we came across a buoy and we thought it was a small ship out at sea for whatever reason on the radar, it just looked like a, like a small blip. But when I went to the bridge to take a look at what was, what was actually out there, it was a buoy that happened to have broken, a, broken its chain and it's just flowing and it was flowing with speed because the winds and the currents, if the ship is not in control, it can drive you. But this buoy didn't have any engine or anything. So it was subject to the winds and the waves. And it was traveling at a brisk five to seven knots of speed, which is roughly about 10 miles an hour. And we were tracking it like a ship. So it's very rare for something to, to break away and travel out at sea. But getting back to the shipwreck, when you get close to shore, you have to know where the shipwrecks are. Otherwise, you run a chance of hitting that ship, and then you end up running aground. We have such individuals in the body of Christ that as a result of listening to strange doctrine, doctrine that is inconsistent with Scripture, to have run aground, and they are nothing but a wreck going nowhere. They are jacked up. They have no power because evidently when the, when the ship is wrecked, it has no power. It can't go anywhere. It's stuck. And such as are certain individuals that listen to strange doctrine. 
Look at what Paul said again in verse 19. Having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. Where did this strange doctrine come from? Paul begins to name names of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. They were teaching strange doctrine and they were also blaspheming the name of the Lord, cursing his word. Go to 2 Timothy. Let's, let's, let's see what, what else we can learn from these individuals that have engaged in strange doctrine. Go to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Once again, Paul says to Timothy, remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. You know, folk like to talk all the time. That's why I thank God that he gave us one mouth and two ears. Just imagine if he had given us two mouths and one ear. People like to talk all the time. And sometimes when you're listening to people, you, if, if, you are, if you are an individual that listen carefully to what people say, you would scratch their head and say, what? What did you say? And they would strive about words that would not benefit anybody. It was no profit. But what else did it do to the ruin of the hearers. That's like a shipwreck. But it's also known as something else, as we'll see further. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why? Because there will be individuals that will wrongly divide the word. And so you have to be careful. You have to listen carefully to what people are saying. Because if you don't, you will begin to believe the thing. And next thing you know, you're talking it. I was channel surfing and I happened to run across Joseph Prince. And everybody is in rave about Joseph Prince. But he started talking about repentance. And I said, all right, you, you might be on to something. But then he began to twist or at least leave out a definition. That's why you got to be careful with those who have a large audience and they have a stage. Got to be careful of that. So he talk, started talking about that, that, that God is for you. He's not against you. And then he started railing on the word repentance. And he said that the definition, which I've said before, and I've preached on the streets until the Lord told me to go back and study the entire definition. It, it does mean change, change the mind. But its root meaning means to turn. Constantly through scripture, especially in Ezekiel 18, Ezekiel 8, uh, Isaiah 55, turn, turn, turn. You see, when you're repenting, you're turning from sin. Now, I didn't listen to all of the message, and I should have, but perhaps I'll see it once again and I'll listen to the entire message. From, but from the time that I turned it on, which is a good five, maybe ten minutes, and some will say, well, that's not justified. But when you start listening to individuals, you pretty much know the repertoire. You just don't hear them discuss sin. For instance, we have individuals that uh, talk about um, abortion 
and, and rightfully so, that they're against abortion. And I even uh, jumped on the bandwagon, if you will, and started talking about abortion. Until you get that prick on the inside from, from the Holy Spirit. And he says this, the root of abortion is fornication and adultery. And I, I started to think in my mind, I said, have I ever heard anybody that spoke about abortion talk about fornication and adultery? Nope. In fact, very rare. Of course it's wrong to murder a baby, but have we ever talked about how the baby got there in the first place? And so you get this prick on the inside of your spirit and you begin to see that fornication and adultery is the fuel for abortion. And so the Lord gave me scripture in, in the Bible. It says, flee fornication. And then you have Hebrews. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter uh, 6 of uh, flee fornication. And then, then, you have, then you have Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4, where it says, marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But adulterers and fornicators, God will judge. We don't hear that. And the reason why we don't hear it is because we don't want to offend anybody. Not realizing that God is offended at sin. We don't want to offend anybody. Why do you think God told the man at the pool of Bethesda in John chapter 5, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you? Or he told the woman that was caught in adultery in John chapter 8, where are, the, where are those accusers? And she said, nowhere, Lord. And then he said, neither do do I condemn thee? And so we get the phrase, put down your rocks, don't throw stones. But we seldom talk about the rest of the verse where it says, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. We don't want to talk about sin, that three-letter word. Because sin is a deliberate, intentional act to defy the known will of God. We don't, we don't want to talk about that. That won't fill seats. That's right. It, it sure won't. <laughs> I want his kingdom filled. Never mind the seeds. Can care less about seeds. So we have to be very careful to, um, to preach the correct word of God and stick with the scriptures 100% of the time. Here's, here's the thing that has brought to my attention. How, how many of us have ever heard the word evangelical? We've heard the word evangelical, and, it's, and actually it's called evangelical Christians. And very few of us, including myself, didn't really understood the title because I thought that that was just a political slogan because that's what the world uses to accuse us of using the Bible to enter into political circles and, and do some things. But the word evangelical comes from this Greek definition and it's called, surprise, surprise, the gospel. <laughs> and I say, wow, Lord, all this time I've been here in evangelical and I didn't understand it. The term evangelical started with Martin Luther in 1521 because Martin Luther began to use, back then, we would call this a technological breakthrough, these 
cell phones that we have. But the technological breakthrough of their day was the printing press. The printing press was their ability to print in mass paper. So instead of somebody screaming out in the, sheet, in, in the streets what the news is, people would be able to read what the news is in mass. Hence your newspapers and so forth. The printing press was a very, very technological technological advance. And so instead of trusting the Catholic church to give doctrine, Martin Luther printed 95 theses and posted it on Wittenberg's door, arguing against indulgences, which is the ability to give the Catholic church money and have your sins washed away which is error, according to what Martin Luther read in the scriptures. So he termed the doctrinal phrase of justification. We get our doctrine of justification from Martin Luther's writing, and he was termed as an evangelical because he was preaching the gospel. Now, remember what it says in in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But verse 24 says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This is partly where we get the doctrine of justification from. Justification simply means though you were guilty of sin, God freely made you innocent based on the redemption of Jesus Christ alone. So that's where we get grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. That's the doctrine of the gospel. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone. Not statues, not their version of the gospel by way of indulgences where you can buy your way out of purgatory, buy your way out of sin. You begin to see that they were wrongly divided in the scriptures and it took someone with courage along with John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and many others, even those that were on the printing press. They are heroes to be able to print the whole gospel. During that time that he was incarcerated, Martin Luther, he began to translate the Bible from Latin into English. So not only was he responsible for every, for getting everybody a copy of the, the New Testament, he was also able to transcribe or translate from Latin to English the entire New Testament. The worst thing that Satan fears, feared then was that everybody had a copy of the Bible. He feared that because now he is able to not fight against the church and win anymore. He now has the Lord working against him with everyone having a copy of their own Bible. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. In other words, what they were attempting to teach out of law and blaspheme Shipwrecking the faith of some, it's just like cancer that spreads. Hymenius and Philetus of this sort. So now we got three individuals, Hymenius, Alexander, and Philetus. And what they were teaching was that the resurrection is already past. 
and they over and they overthrow the faith of some. In other words, they begin to believe it. Now, wait a minute. All you got to do is go to the graveyards and see that them people are still in their graves. <laughs> and they didn't have en enough sense to, to at least go to the graveyard. If you say that the resurrection is past, resurrection means to come to life. That means whatever is in the grave comes alive. You didn't even have enough sense to even go down to the graveyard to see if any of the individuals that were saved in Christ is out of their grave. That alone would have ended their false doctrine. And that's why we, we try, we try desperately to tell y'all, put it to the test. For instance, there was this one pastor out there in Africa. He says, I'm going to walk on water. So he started walking on, he started walking on the shore and he, he kept going because he, he, he wanted to walk on water. And everybody out there was watching him. But he kept sinking. He kept going down. He drowned because he believed he can walk on water. Put it to the test. Well, now he know. Now he know it don't work. <laughs> but he he knows too late. Folks, you do yourself no harm by putting what you hear to the test. In fact, why don't you go to a uh, first Thessalonians chapter five, put it to the test. Now, nobody is going to fault you for putting it to the test. Nobody's going to fault you. You see the whole problem with false prophets and teachers is that when you do tell them that it don't work and you put them to the test, they're, they're scared of being exposed. You see, they're scared of being exposed. That's why when you hear strange doctrine, the first thing that you do is put them to the test. It's called touchstone. What touchstone is, is like, it's, it's, it's like, it's like fire and you're putting whatever it is through the test of fire. Truth always puts everything to the test. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, starting there. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. And, and sometimes that's where we stop. But read the rest of, of the verses here. Test all things. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Put it to the test and don't be afraid to, because when you put it to the test and then you, you, you just don't put it through one test, you put it through a series of tests because if it's true, then it will be consistent because we're looking for consistency here. We're not just looking for a one size fits all and then it's supposed to work that way all the time. No, you constantly put what's questionable to the test. You see, false doctrine fails 100% of the time. True doctrine succeeds 100% of the time. And that's why you have to be that studious, you have to put everything to the test. I came across uh, some interesting statements um, that that really um, that really helped me in some places. For instance, like 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 like, like when we talk about hell. Here's, here's, here's another thing that we do. And, and just reading off of, off of a Facebook post, it says, why is hell so awful? One, it was created for Satan and his demons. True, that's in Matthew chapter 25. Second, because people don't realize that hell is the absence of God. 
And, and that's not true because of what it says in Psalm 139, if, my make, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. There's no air in hell. Well, I, I don't know about that because if you're talking, you're breathing down there. Because God is a breath of life, when, and that's true in, in, in that sense. There is no peace in hell. Well, that's true because of what it says in Isaiah 40. You know, there's no peace to, for the wicked. I think it's Isaiah 40, Isaiah 43. I could be wrong. Because God is the prince of peace. Well, that's Jesus because Jesus is God, so that's true. There is no comfort in hell. Right, there's no rest for the wicked. That's what the book of Isaiah says. Because God is the comforter. There is no love in hell. Because God is love. Hell is darkness because God is the light. You do not have to go there, but there is only one way to escape it, and that is through salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. For the most part, that's good. But one thing that we always tend to leave out, we leave out the story of the rich man and Lazarus in that the rich man said, send Lazarus that he may dip the finger and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. We, we don't want to talk about flame because that's just a bit over the top. But you see, hell is not just is not separation from the presence of God. Jesus didn't describe it as that. Jesus described it as torment in flames. See, what we try to do is we try to make the gospel a little bit more acceptable to people so that way they can somehow come to church. But you see, you can get them to come to church, but are they in the kingdom? It's a difference. You see, if there is no incentive to get saved, then very few people will get saved. Because if people don't understand the magnitude of their sin, and that sin, their sin will put them in torment of flames. If they don't see the, the importance of that, the magnitude of that, very few will repent. So, so, so when Joseph Prince gave those definitions, I said, wow. You see, what we've done with the gospel is that we've tried to cut down a tree with a plastic fork. No knife, no plastic knife, a fork. Now, you know that you cannot cut down a tree with a plastic fork, but that's what we do with the gospel because we, we're trying to make it as acceptable as possible so that we, people can receive it. But no, we don't do that. We don't change the gospel because we like to. We're instructed to give the gospel as is. People have to make up their own minds whether or not they want to repent of sin or not. People have to turn from their sin. And here's the other thing that, that Joseph Prince had, had forgotten. Here's another thing that he forgot. You see, very seldom when you hear these things, you don't hear them talk about John chapter 3 and verse 3. Born again. See, Satan has so vilified the term born again that very few, pe very few people out there on the streets Use it to preach to people that you must be born again. Because it's been vilified. Oh, you're one of those born again people. Yep. Because if you're not born again, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. If you're not born of the water and born of the spirit, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. And that was missing from his preaching. So I pray that he would repent of his falsification of the gospel and come back to the plain scriptures because I get it because I tried to do it. 
I get it. You want to be famous on the stage. You want people to listen to you. You want to make disciples after yourself. You want to show how many people you got under, under your teaching. You want to be famous. But whenever it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, no one is famous except Jesus and him alone. So when you see two things missing from gospel preaching, the preaching against sin, that's one, and that you must be born again, two, their gospel is a cheap gospel. Their gospel is a cheap gospel. And so um, I came across something that was very, very good. The difference between what is sound doctrine and, and, and doctrine that isn't sound is simply this, the difference between modern Jesus and the biblical Jesus. In sound doctrine, the biblical Jesus preaches God's righteousness. The modern Jesus preaches only on love. I mean, have you ever noticed something that, that has entered into the music of praise and worship? Have you ever noticed that it's all about his love? Have you ever noticed that? All about his love, and rightfully so for believers, because we thank God for his love, because the Bible does tell us in the book of uh, Romans chapter 8 that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but shall have everlasting life. But if that's all you preach and not preach on God's righteousness and the reason why he brings judgment to the earth simply because of his righteousness, then it's very easy to, it's very easy to gravitate on the love of God part. Because see, if you know anything about the righteousness of God, it demands a complete turn from sin a complete rejection of, of sin, which is a deliberate, intentional act of defiance against the known will of God. Here's another thing about the biblical Jesus. He gives salvation, hope, peace, and joy. We see that in scripture. But here's the modern Jesus. He gives you health and wealth. Well, Satan offers that too, you know. In fact, he offered that to Jesus when he was tempted in the wilderness. All these things will I give you if you'll bow down and worship me. Now we thank God for health and wealth, but that's not the total sum of all that he does. Because sooner or later, health and wealth will end and cease and we will no longer be in this life. Here's the other thing about a biblical Jesus. He warns of sin, judgment, and hell. The modern Jesus that the world in some places, even in some places of some houses of worship, never says anything negative because sin, judgment, and hell is negative. But guess what? They serve as incentives to live the word of God as preached and to stay that way serves as an incentive. Here's another example of the biblical Jesus, hated and despised by the world. I don't want to be hated. I want to be loved. Uh, well, uh, th this gospel is not for you. But the modern Jesus is loved and accepted by the world. I was watching an interview on YouTube of T.D. Jakes and Oprah Winfrey. And Oprah Winfrey, I mean, it's just like the devil to ask a pointed question because he knew what kind of answer he would give. Is homosexuality a sin, she asked him. And he said, yes, homosexuality is a sin, but 
I just don't t- touch on that. I don't just I don't touch on that. We want we want people, you know, to come. I said, wait, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where's your stance on the gospel? He stood a little while and then he went backwards, but then he went full. I mean, what we would call in the Navy, all back full. In fact, emergency all back full. That's when you're going backwards in an emergency fashion. He was on an interview with this dude, and, 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 and this dude asked him point blank, what about homosexuals, the LGBT community? What do you think about that? He says, oh, 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 oh I believe that the church can, can co- coexist with the LGBT community. That's what Jake said. But he also said, he also asked a question, so, 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 so your thing about homosexuality is evolving. And, and t- this is Jake's word for word answer. Oh, it's evolved and evolving. That's why we have uh, the Bible. Malachi 3 and 6, I am the Lord, I change not. That's why we have James chapter 1, where it says that in whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. That's why we have Hebrews 6, that by two immutable things, it is impossible for God to lie. That's why we have Numbers 23. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And when you have preachers that perhaps some of you highly esteem because they preach so good, and they compromise the scriptures, and you're still listening to them. Look, you can listen to anyone you want. But the moment they forsake God and the scriptures, I'm out. I am out of there. I don't want to have nothing to do with you. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 33, evil communications corrupts good manners. I don't want you to communicate to me your corrupt manners. I'm going to protect my heart, guard my heart, according to Proverbs 4 and verse 23. Be diligent to guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. I will turn and walk away and insult you just by my walking away. I won't even listen to your voicemail. I will walk away from you quickly, have nothing to do with you. Oh, I'm insulted. Good. Glad you're insulted. At least you know where I stand. Here's another thing about the biblical Jesus. God, uh, rather exalt God, the Father's will. But the modern Jesus serves your will, not God's will. What do you mean by serves your will? We'll tell you anything you want to hear just so that way you can be happy and pleased. Don't tell me that, preacher, but tell me this. Well, what is that? I charge you, therefore, before the Lord Jesus Christ. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, exhort. And, and rebuke with all long suffering and, and doctrine, for the time will come when they will not endure a sound doctrine. That's what that is. They, they're there to serve your will, to make you happy. And that's what people do sometimes. They want to come to places where you can make them happy. I'm not down for that. That's not my job. My job is to give you the word of God, whether you're happy or not. Here's another thing. The biblical Jesus offends the world with truth. But the modern Jesus hates to offend you or others. In other words, if you offend them, they won't come back. And if they won't come back, they won't give money. 
Because when people leave, money leaves. So let me preach to you something that you like so you can come back and so that way there could be money. Folks, that's not what we're here for. And that's doctrine that isn't sound, which is the modern kind of Jesus they want, which is a violation of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. And then we have people in the church that... They quickly listen to things Jesus never said and rebuke what he, do, what he did say. Listen to your heart. I used to preach that, you know, and had to stop preaching that because the Bible says in Jeremiah 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, know the hearts. Do not listen to your heart. Why? Romans chapter 8 and verse 14 says, As many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. So you listen to the Holy Spirit who's inside your heart, but you don't listen to your heart because it is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Be true to yourself. Jesus never said that. Jesus never said, listen to your heart. Be true to yourself is out there in the world with the homosexuals and the transgenders. Be true to yourself. Come out the closet. Don't lie about it. Don't hide it anymore. Just come out. No, you are to be true to God by obeying his word. You see, we see a whole lot of nice quotes of scriptures and whatnot, but very few times do we see people tell other people to obey the word of God. Obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams in 1 Samuel 15. Because God can care less about a sacrifice where your heart is not in it. Like Saul. God told Saul, kill all the Amalekites. And what did he do? He kept all the fatlings of the, of the rams and, and bulls and all sorts of things. And God told him to kill everything. He disobeyed God. Because he was influenced by the people. That's why the pastor must never listen to the people. The pastor must listen to God and his word. I, I, I came across something and everybody want a word from God. Oh, I want a word. I want a word. I want a word from God. Give me a word, preacher. Give me a word. <laughs> Okay, it's in 66 books. Here's your word, y'all. 66 books. Get to digging. You want a word from God? It's in these 66 books. Start digging. God gave us his word, 66 books. You want a word from God? 66 books. Trust your gut. That's another thing that Jesus never said. You don't trust your gut. You know why? Because your gut is your belly. And your belly can turn and change at a moment's notice. Feed or feel good about who you are. See, Jesus never said that. Jesus never said feel good about who you are. He never said that. Jesus never said happiness is what matters. 
He never said that. He never said, just be a good person. Why? Well, the answer is very simple with that. Matthew chapter 19 with the rich young ruler. He said, good master, a good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then Jesus turned around and says, why do you call me good? There's one that is good, and that is God. None of us are good. None of us. There is none that is good, the Bible says. No, not one. None of us. There is none righteous. No, not one. In just in case you want a reference of Psalm 14, verse 1, and Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. Here's what Jesus actually said. You see, that's the difference between doctrine that is sound and doctrine that isn't sound. When you start hearing these, these fluffy statements and you feel good all of a sudden, but then all of a sudden you get to the point where Jesus said this, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Nobody want to crucify themselves every day. That's painful. You see, that's the difference between what the world offers that infiltrated into the church and what the, what the Lord offers that's always been in Scripture. And there's always been this warfare. And that's why you have to be careful of those that are around you. You have to begin to listen carefully. And then some of them will even use Scripture to justify it. But, but here's how you put, you put their use of that Scripture to, to the test. You put it to the test. You, you test it out. And if it didn't work, well, guess what? It wasn't, it wasn't true doctrine. It was false doctrine. Here in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 17, and their message will spread like cancer. Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort who have strayed concerning the truth. Strayed. I think it was, uh, had to be a, been a couple of months ago. Man, I came across this scripture and I said, wow. Uh, and and uh, you don't have to turn there, but write it down if, or, or type it down if you're taking notes. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. I preached from this before. Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. In other words, grab a hold of the scriptures and do not drift. It's just like being tied to the pier. You have mooring lines tied to the pier that ties to the to the, tie the ships to, to the piers and the ship won't drift. Be tied to the Lord just like a ship is tied to the pier so you won't drift. But what did Hymenaeus and Philetus did? They've strayed concerning the truth. In other words, you can always tell an individual when they're drifting slowly. You begin to hear questionable teaching that has nothing to do with the scriptures. For instance, let, let's, let's look at it, at it for instance. Let's, let's look at Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Let's see, we do have time. Starting at, at, uh, at verse 1, Matthew chapter 11, verse 1. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you the one coming, or do we seek for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see. The blind see and the lame walk. The, leap, the leapers are cleansed, or the lepers are, the lepers are cleansed, rather. Leapers, lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. 
The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. As they departed, Jesus began to say to the multitudes concerning John, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man clothed in soft garments? Indeed, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I say to you, and more than a prophet. For this is, a, this is he of whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare you who will prepare your way before you. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. You know, in my ignorant days, I used to just preach from this most of the time. People would go off. The violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. The violent take it by force. You need to take it by force. No. Why take something that's already been given to you by the Lord? The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 8 that he freely gives us all things. Then Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3 says that we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why should I take by force what I already possess? You see how false doctrine can be created because we want to excite the people in such a way that they don't really take time to think through the scripture to see what it actually says. And so quick to jump on the bandwagon, everybody is in an emotional frenzy and not really thinking through the scriptures. Why did the kingdom of heaven suffered violence? Because people were pressing into the kingdom. People were repenting of their sins and pressing into the kingdom. And the only way that Jesus could describe it was by saying the violent take it by force. Look, I ain't got to take nothing from Satan. I ain't got to take nothing from him. Jesus already did everything necessary. So why should I get up in the middle of the night and start screaming at the devil? Give me my stuff. Give me my stuff. I'm taking back my stuff. Satan's like saying, you don't know your Bible very well, do you? You don't know who you are, do you? Keep screaming. It ain't working. This scripture talks about people pressing into the kingdom because of the word of repentance that John the Baptist was speaking of. See, it's very easy to create false doctrine and jump all over the place and not really think through the scriptures. And that's why, at least at this late hour of where I am in life, it's a return to the very basics of the Scripture. The pastor is turn, returning to the very basics of the Scriptures and not applying elasticity to the text because Proverbs 30 and verse 6 simply says that if you add to his word, he'll find you a liar. And that's why people are all, are all jacked up these days because they're trying to get something to work that was never intended to work a particular way. And then all of a sudden, we get disappointed and we find ourselves more than drifting. We're walking out because God said in his word and it didn't work. So I don't want to have nothing to do with God. You're not, in, you're not in God because he gives you stuff. You're in God because he's saving you from his wrath. It's about his wrath and it's about his judgment that he came. All this other stuff 
It's just window dressing to attract people to fill seats. But yet their soul is still lost. Their name is not written in heaven. And all they are mesmerized about is how well the preacher preaches. And it's just like what Leonard Ravenhill says. They sit comfortably in church while they slip comfortably into hell. You do not have the right to create a doctrine because you seem to have some type of special revelation that nobody else got. And all you want to do is have disciples to follow after you because you got some kind of special revelation. No, this is not what we're supposed to do with the scriptures been listening to our Prevailing Word podcast. I'm Fred Rochester. Thanks for listening.